So our goal is to work towards automatically producing input speech for uh, produced gesture for virtual humans based on input speech. Let me quickly make this small. Okay. Uh, and there are three main approaches um, for gesture generation. There are rule-based approaches that use explicit phrase to gesture rules. There are statistical modeling approaches that model the conditional probabilities between certain speech features co-occurring with specific motion features. And then there are, of course, machine learning approaches, uh, which our work relates most to. And machine learning approaches often work with unstructured uh, input and output data, working in a kind of a black box manner, assuming a general implicit relationship between the input speech and the output motion, but also trying to model it exactly by using exact joint positions and angles, which is a problem because there's really a multitude of possible gestures for each speech utterance. Um, there are many possible true gestures and not one true post sequence. So how do we measure then the performance? So attempting to model um, the output gesture as sequences of joint positions or angles can fail to capture the natural variety of gesture and lead to a kind of a regression to a mean pose and lethargic boring motion. So for cause of this problem, we want to explore other ways to represent gesture than explicit joint positions and angles. For this, first we look back to the theory of gesture. And McNeil says with his growth, growth point theory that speech and gesture have the same origin. So speech may give us indi an indication of the underlying intention that inspired a gesture, but it may never fully predict the gesture expression. So there's a kind of um, implicit indeterministic inter relationship between the top channel here that we can see the speech output and the bottom channel, which is the gesture output. Now we want to know for our gesture generation problem, which aspects of the gesture output are actually well correlated with the speech output output. And there are really two main questions that we want to answer for ourselves. So first of all, which gesture characteristics are predictable from the speech, because that's what we need in a gesture generation driven by speech. And then secondly, we also want to know which of these um, gesture characteristics are perceptually important for creating a match between a generated gesture and the speech. So what would look good and what's important. Um, to look, uh, to find the parameters um, to represent gestures, we want to find a set of parameters that are automatically extractable because we want to work with large data sets and we do not want to deal with hours and hours of hand annotation. And we want to choose parameters that have a perceptual impact. And to find these candidates, we look to previous work on gesture parametrization to find a suitable set of parameters. For example, Neff and colleagues found that they can influence perceptions of extraversion by modifying the gesture rate, so the frequency of gesture, and the scale of the gestures, how large the gestures were. And then Smith and Neff showed that they can also influence perceptions of actually all big five personality traits by modifying a set of 12 different gesture parameters, also including the gesture velocity and the extent of the fingers. Then Castillo and Neff also showed that they can influence perceptions of emotion by modifying gesture using um, a set of 11 similar parameters to represent the gesture. So based on this previous work, we select a set of five easily extractable parameters to represent our gestures. First is the gesture velocity, then the size of the initial acceleration peak, which describes the velocity profile, then the gesture size, which is measured by two measures. First, the absolute path length um, produced by a wrist. And then second, the major axis length, which is the length of the axis between the minimum and the maximum point of the gesture. Then we have arm swivel, which describes the rotation around an axis between the shoulder and the wrist, bringing the elbow in or away from the body. And the hand opening to the extent to which the fingers are spread out. And we base all computations on the stroke phase of a gesture, which is the expressive phase of a gesture, carrying the whole emphasis and the meaning. And for segmenting our data into this stroke phase, part of the data was hand annotated previously, and the rest was then automatically annotated using a classifier neural network that we presented in the previous work. 
So we use a total set of 10 hours of data, which is combined from two data sets. Um, this is a sample just of the first data set. So we captured high quality 3D motion with um, speech and video and is produced by a native English speaker producing uninterrupted, spontaneous, unrehearsed and natural conversational speech. And then we have a second data set, um, which is the same recording setup, but a very different speaker style. So if you can see that the speaker is much more animated, um, he's very dynamic, um, just producing a very overall different appearance in his gesturing. Um, by using the motion of both of these data sets and segmenting them into the stroke phase of the gesture, so segmenting it into individual gestures, we accumulate over 23,000 examples of gestures to train on. So our first step is to model the speech to gesture relationship, the speed, uh, parameter, speech to gesture parameter relationship. And um, our goal is to find out which parameters that we chose are we able to predict from the speech and then for us to understand how well does the speech signal relate to a given gesture parameter. So if a model, if we can predict a parameter well from speech, this means there's a close relationship between the speech signal and this parameter. Um, the network is here visualized on the left, but we will not go into the detail here because we're not trying to make a case for the best architecture. It's just a relatively standard recurrent neural network. Um, so we train a separate model for each parameter, which means we train one model for velocity, one for initial acceleration, etc. And the input speech here at the top of the model, you can see, is um, the speech just proce processed as the GMAP's acoustic features, which are automatically extractable. And then the output is two values, which is one value for each hand. So for example, the velocity model will output one value for the velocity for the right hand and one for the velocity of the left hand. And we don't actually know which hand is performing the gesture since the handedness is not labeled in the data set. So the model might be able to learn general statistics regarding the differences between these hands. For example, if the left hand is generally slower, but it will likely not be able to predict diverging values, which would then indicate the gesture handedness. For example, predicting a high velocity for the right hand and zero velocity for the left hand, which would indicate that it was indeed a right-handed gesture, unless this model learns to successfully infer handedness from the audio signal as well, which is unlikely and which we did not observe in the output. So this is just, just to say that hand labeling would probably significantly improve results in the future. Um, to measure our, the performance of our models, we use two uh, different uh, measures. So the first one is just the simple difference of the predicted value of the model um, to the true value of the model. And then our second measure is a comparison to a baseline model. And the baseline model um, uses um, the database to draw samples from. So for each value that it needs to predict, for each velocity value, for example, it needs to predict, it draws a true sample from all true samples, meaning that its, own, its output distribution will follow the true data distribution. And we also draw these samples speaker specific, which means that just learning speaker classification is not enough for our model to outperform the baseline model because the baseline model um, already has the information of which speaker is um, the sample supposed to be from. So by comparing our model to this baseline model, we can learn how much information we can gain from the speech signal because that is the um, inherent difference is that our model actually also works on the speech input to make a prediction. So let's look at the results compared to this baseline model. So we can see here in 3.1, the path length was 60 and 61% for the left and right hand was predicted best, but we actually found that there was a strong correlation of this path length with the speech input length, which is based on the motion segmentation. So to remove this kind of motion-based information advantage, um, we additionally restrict random sampling, so the baseline sampling, to only draw from samples that have a very similar gesture size, which would then lead the baseline model to only draw from around 
5% of the samples, which includes the true sample as well. So this is to say that the baseline model is actually quite good. So it has sets the bar relatively high. It has actually quite a lot of information. So all the other um, baseline samples are drawn with this more constrained model. And we can see that, for example, surprisingly, ARM swivel number four um, had relatively low prediction errors, whereas something simple like velocity, the first one, was actually not predicted very well at all. Um, instead, the initial acceleration peak was better predicted than the velocity. So we see that audio was only partially successful at predicting the gesture parameters. And now we want to understand which gesture parameters must still be accurately realized in order to achieve a satisfying motion uh, to speech match. To do this, we run an empirical evaluation of the impact of a gesture parameter on the perception of speech gesture match. We artificially increase or decrease a parameter within a gesture to see what perceptual impact this parameter has. For example, you can see here, we use a sample with high initial acceleration peaks and we artificially decrease these peaks. Key key man in New Zealand's backline. I mean, he's been around for years and years and years and years. He's kind of one of those guys that's close to retirement. But again, he's like a fine wine. The older he gets, just the better he gets. And then we asked participants just one question, which was how well did the expressive quality of the gestures match the expressive quality of the speech? Here's just another example, just to visualize um, what an increased arm swivel looks like. So the elbows are moved away from the body more than they were actually in this gesture sequence. And then another example is the hand opening increase. So the fingers are completely extended here. Okay, so let's look at the results. All gesture modifications had a significant perceptual un impact, so unmodified gestures were preferred over all modification conditions, which indicates some perceptual relevance for each of the five gesture parameters. If you look on the very right, we had a very large effect of hand opening with the open flat hand that we just saw in a previous stimulus rating receiving significantly lower um, ratings than all other modifications. And a decreased hand opening, so slightly curled fingers, were preferred over most other, most other modifications. Since modeling finger motion is a complex problem due to the high dimensionality of the hand skeleton, when ha accurate hand shape prediction is not possible, based on our results, we suggest animating slightly flexed fingers rather than straight fingers. Modifying arm swivel, next hand opening, also received relatively low ratings. So we see, for example, that arm swivel uh, realization, accurate arm swivel realization is important. Notably, arm swivel was also predicted relatively well in our speech to gesture parameter model. On the other hand, velocity, um, the second to the left, was, did significantly worsen speech to gesture match. But velocity was also harsh to model from speech, which indicates need for more work. You can also see that for gesture size, enlarged gestures were preferred over reduced size gestures. And machine learning models um, on gesture generation are often trained with a mean squared error that commonly avoids moving too far from the mean pose. So our results show that it is very important for a model to actually be able to move away further from this mean pose and produce larger gestures. So to conclude, all gesture parameters were predicted above chance, but there was variance in how well they were predicted. For example, the size of a gesture was predicted better than its velocity. Arm swivel prediction surprisingly surpassed all other measures but the path length describing the gesture size. And while gesture parameter predictions were all significantly above the baseline, they did remain well short of the ground truth, indicating that audio alone may not be sufficient to predict the gesture performance. In our perceptual study, we found that modifying any of the five parameters significantly decreased the speech gesture match, and hand pose showed to be particularly important, with the flat open hand being viewed especially negatively and more flexed fingers being preferred. Also, enlarged gestures were preferred over reduced size gestures. Our parameters provide numeric gesture descriptors that impact the perceived match of the generated gesture. 
This can be used as an alternative measure for judging generated gestures. So we can use expressive parameters instead of average joint position errors to model the output of a gesture, genera gesture generator. In future work, we'd like to explore the use of more speech information for both improving the predictions of expressivity, as we did here, the style of a gesture, as well as addressing content, so the semantic meaning of a gesture, by, for example, including the transcripts, the semantic, semantics of the speech content. We also want to explore um, detecting gesture strokes from the speech, as currently we did it from the motion data. And finally, we want to explore gesture generation based on parametrization to avoid the problem of predicting high dimensional skeleton data. Thank you.